first of all, how many of you guys have, aside from the introduction and maybe in this class, heard of inbound marketing and it actually being used in businesses? Good. Under what context? Throw up something. Just speak up. Under what context have you heard or interacted with inbound marketing? In the business world, reading blogs. Business world. Using it in the business world. Uh, a company that I work for was really close to getting their presence online creating a Facebook site. Right. Good. Good. Anybody else? I, would, um, I worked for HBO over the summer, and one of the projects was looking how to increase their Right. Okay. I work for a web based B2B setup and uh, right. I use your more marketing. Okay, good. Okay. Um, part of my job for coming to uh, the MBA program, we were doing uh, a search for social media monitoring vendors. So taking a look at there, how they uh, do a social media space to right. uh, track customers. So okay. Awesome. Anybody else? Okay. Good. Um, I think probably <clears throat> a little bit of what we're going to go through here, let me move this cursor over out of the way without screwing something up. What we're going to go through a little bit here is maybe stretching out what you guys are talking about, what you think of when you think of inbound marketing. Um, the way we're going to talk about inbound marketing today is a group of strategies, and we're going to go through a couple of definitions early here, get through the boring stuff first and just get it out of the way. Um, think of inbound marketing not as using Facebook, using a blog, um, strictly interacting with clients. Think of it as a larger strategy. Think of it as a different way of doing business than we did f five years ago, really, and even 10 years ago. Our company, and I'm going to get to it in a second and tell you who we are and what we do, but our company's been testing the waters with inbound marketing type tactics for about eight years now, almost nine years. Um, so think back eight, nine years ago, there was no hot Facebook. There were, we were, I don't know, coming out of the ugly AOL, AOL chat room era, um, who then would have ever dreamt that we could actually do business on the internet. Um, so what we started playing with was figuring out how we can integrate that offline world with the, in, the online world and do it in an economical manner. Um, so as we're going through inbound marketing, don't think of just social media. Think of it as a large strategy, and we're going to talk about a couple of those here in a few minutes. Um, let me say this first. Speak up. Raise your hand. Talk. Um, we're probably going to be here for a little while, so I don't want to talk the whole time. You can kind of hear it in my voice. I'm just recovering from losing my voice, so I want to hear from you guys. Um, questions, interaction. Um, case studies you want to talk about, let's do it. What works, what won't work. Um, you're going to see when I introduce our business in a few minutes, we're out there in the real world right now. Um, so we see some of the things that work and some of the things that don't work. Um, we do a lot of studying. We do a lot of researching. Uh, we look at a lot of the numbers that LD was just showing on the screen a few minutes ago, and then we go out and find out if they're real. We go out and find out if somebody's just publishing numbers um, to beef their products to beef their social networks, to beef up their software, and we go find out if it actually works for our clients and our potential clients, so we can talk through some of that, those kind of things I'm gonna get also. through a couple of definitions, and bear with me for a second, but let's read these couple of slides here. Um, inbound marketing, remember, we're not just talking about social media again. Focus is on creating powerful content, which was, you mentioned a little while ago, that will lead potential customers to your brand, product, or service line through online methods, like searching, referrals, links from other web entities, such as blogs, video, and social communities. Okay, notice it didn't just say internet here. It did say online methods. So part of what we're going to talk through here is how to integrate. Remember the shotgun advertising that LD threw up here a few minutes ago, the outbound marketing side? We call that shotgun advertising. Back in the day, in the agencies, we called those shotgun advertising. We just throw your billboard up, and hopefully it works, and hopefully somebody remembers your name, that whole brand awareness campaign thing, or maybe they'll call a phone number on a direct mailer. Well, all of those in our scheme of inbound marketing fits into inbound marketing. So we filter it all back into our online 
um, lead generation web forms, even our offline advertising. So you can see kind of where I'm getting at here. You got to think bigger picture with inbound marketing. Don't just think what you can do online. You think efficiency for your client or efficiency for the company that you're working for. It's much more efficient to work and handle leads and the sales process, and we're going to talk through some of that in a second, with online methods and um, online tactics. So remember that and keep that in mind. I know, I told you this was boring, but we got <laughs> one more to go. All right. Read. I <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I like that one. Throw that in every once in a while. <laughs> Inbound marketing, a complement set of marketing techniques focused on driving quality prospects to your business and its products. Not online, not offline, both. Inbound marketing has become widely accepted because it supports the way consumers make purchasing decisions. Very critical. You guys have probably talked about profiling consumers and profiling your potential clients. Um, using the internet and its tools to learn about their products and services that best meet their needs. We're going to talk again there in a few minutes to address that last part of that last sentence about a new term called social graphics. Anybody familiar with social graphics as opposed to demographics? Demographics, profiling your consumers, you're profiling them online. Where do they hang out? Who do they like? We're going to talk about that in a few minutes also. So um, another aspect of inbound marketing that you've got to think about is social graphics. Very similar to the slide that LD threw up a few minutes ago. This is kind of a definition. What is inbound marketing? Um, I put up here, and I almost took it off, remember outbound marketing. Well, it, it, it insinuates that it's in the past. It's not. Outbound marketing is not ever going to go away. Um, outbound advertising is not ever going to go away. There's always going to be an audience for billboards. There's always going to be an audience for newspapers, depending on your demographics. There's always going to be an audience for direct mailers, until the post office goes out of business, I guess. Um, and uh, for a while, there are still trade shows going on out there. So we've got to figure out a way, since those audiences are still out there, we've got to figure out a way to still be able to reach that audience and manage our leads efficiently for your company or for your, your client. We talked about the sales, you talked about the sales process, LD did a few minutes ago. So this is a slide that I, I've been using for a long time. It came from HubSpot. You guys, some of you guys might have heard of HubSpot. They build um, a decent tool set on the internet for inbound marketing. Um, again, when you're reading about folks like that, you gotta think relevance, you gotta think how it really matches to you and how it um, pertains to you and your client or your, your, um, your company that you're working for. And HubSpot's tools and techniques don't always work with everyone, but I really like the slide right here. The old way the sales team used to manage and handle prospects down through the sales funnel. Of course, I think it was even mentioned a few minutes ago, but we talked about the sales funnel. This, under our new inbound marketing scheme and our inbound marketing tactics, is the way the sales process is handled. The customer is now in almost total control at the very beginning because you've put information out there or your company has put information out there on the internet for them to go and find. Think about buying a car today. I know darn well if you guys have bought a car in the last five years, you went on the internet first and found the car you wanted and then you went to the sales guy because you didn't want to talk to the car salesman. Um, that's exactly what we're talking about right, right here. The customer's in control of doing the shopping. The customer's in control through all these communities and all these mediums out on the internet now. Um, and we're gonna talk about this in a second also. The main one being your company website or your product's website and your product's blog. The main one being there, get that information out there because this is how consumers like to shop today. So you can see now the customer's in control up here until they decide to interact with you whether they interact with you through lead generation web forms, um, through contacting you through the Facebook page, or through Twitter, or however they do it, or even picking up the phone, they still fit in that same sales funnel. A lot of even automated answering systems will send uh, potential clients to call in on a call line to a landing page on a website for more information. Go get the information, and then we'll figure out really what the company's saying. We'll figure out if we want to assign a salesperson to you after we qualify you, after we qualify that lead. So even then, in that old school way of doing things in the sales process, the sales team is forcing them back up and out and get those consumers qualified before we spend money on the sales guys, before I assign the sales guy to that lead. 
Um, so this is a total new way of, um, of dealing with consumers and sales prospects. Questions so far? We all good? Everybody awake? Okay, all roads lead to me. If you don't get anything else from today, you need to remember the strategy right here. This is what inbound marketing is. Setting up your presence on the internet and let everybody find you. Now you guys, I see you already, you're reading across here, you fan across, you see all these online communities, and you can see these offline traditional advertising techniques are in this package also. Um, I'm not gonna talk about it right yet, but I'm gonna show you how to wrap these offline advertising um, techniques back into data collection web forms, content on, the, on your website and on your blog. Yeah. What is social bookmarking? Social bookmarking is delicious, dig, Reddit, okay. none of those sound familiar. Um, <laughs> that's sometimes kind of a tough situation to describe because I'm not a social bookmark user. It makes no sense to me why someone would make dig.com their homepage instead of google.com or bing.com. But there are a billion people across the world that that's their homepage. Um, the difference... To now. I'm sorry. Google jumped into that game though with the Google iPage. Yes. The difference there is content on social bookmarking websites is submitted by the data owner. Like if we write a blog article and we have content about a certain product or service on our blog or on our website, we as the blog owner go out and submit that web page to dig and stumbled upon and delicious. And then the folks that use those communities can find them in their index. So the good part about that is it's good information. There's not a bunch of spam information in there, like sometimes you find a lot on Google. Um, so back to my point, it's kind of hard to explain because I'm not a dig user, um, but we can't omit those communities. We can't omit those social bookmarking communities. Um, you've got to, as a content owner and as a data owner out in the world now, you've got to get your information on those bookmarking websites. The good thing about those is people who use them tend to have like minds, and people who right. don't use those don't. Right. So it's kind of self-selecting. If you're there, it's like minds, they're always kind of there too. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit more stratified, it's just not a general web page that would select. So right. You've got to be, kind of, be bent in that area. For like There's a selfish tactic to using those too. Part of inbound marketing, and um, I'm going to talk about it in a second, but I'll, I'll go ahead and hit on it now. Um, there's two major pieces that help you with organic search traffic. Everybody know what organic search traffic is? Raw search on Google. That, those are, that's, when you go and search for Toyota Camrys in Richmond and you get a list of websites in Google and somebody clicks on it, that's organic search traffic. It's non-paid. It's not the pay-per-click advertising on the side. Right, right, right. So organic is what you want because it's raw um, usually quality search traffic getting to your website. So what, what was I saying here? Oh, there's a, a selfish reason for using so, uh, a social bookmarking websites. The two main aspects of inbound marketing, remember these two pieces, um, strategic content on your website, and we've talked, we're going to talk about keyword research and that kind of thing, getting quality content on your website and your blog based on those that are searching for information on the internet in a certain demographic or certain social graphic. Getting quality content on your website and the number of inbound links pointing to your website out on the internet. Those two things right there is what moves you up in Google and Yahoo and Bing. If you don't do anything else for any of your web presences, you have to do those two things or you'll never move up on these, on the, these two gigantic websites. Can you repeat that again? Yep. What, what makes you move up in, in Strategic content targeted toward the search traffic you want to catch using Toyota Camry in the text a lot on your website. So quality content and the number of pages, the number of times you use that in your website, and then inbound links coming in, pointing to your website. So if you're submitting your articles, your blog articles, to the social bookmarking websites, each one of them is a link back to your website. So when Google spiders dig.com and they see links pointing to your website, and by the time they finish their spider routines around the internet to all these social bookmarking sites and Facebook and Twitter, and they see that t there's 10,000 links out on the internet to your website, 
They think you're important, so they move you up in the search engines. Explain why you want to remove that. Um, well, if you've ever searched for anything on Google, how many times have you clicked that next button? Probably not many. Gone to page two, page three, page four. Most of the time, if it's not above the fold, we all know what above the fold is on the internet, top of your laptop screen so you're not scrolled down. If you're not above the fold, probably the top first three quarters of page number one, you might as well not be doing anything. Some SEO shops will tell you, we just can't get you up there. You know, this is as good as we can do. We'll get you on page two, page three. Uh, okay, well maybe, uh, maybe it's time to go hire somebody else or, or find another shop or that kind of thing. So, but you've got to get on page one and those two things are the major factors that'll get you on page one on the website. Really, the other thing that goes along with that is time. You won't get that done in a week. It takes time because Google has to go do all that spidering. They, you have to catch them on their routines and it takes time because they also put weight on the newness of websites and web content on the internet. So if there's ever a tie, the tiebreakers are whoever's been around the longest. So keep flowing along this, these lines. The prep work, all right, what do, we do, what do we have to do first before we even get to any of this? Inbound links, we just talked about inbound links. We have to get out there, start using social bookmarking sites. Social communities are perfect for that. Um, getting our articles on, on our Facebook page, um, Facebook business page, getting our articles on our Twitter pages, um, getting our articles on our Bebo pages, depending on your demographics and where you are, on your friend feed pages, and links back to your website. Search engine optimization, you've got to get out and do your keyword research out on the internet. You've got to find out what people are actually searching for on the internet in your demographic area. Not what you think they're searching for, not what your mom thinks she's searching for. There are tools out there that you can go, that, that agencies have, and some shops and larger companies have, where you can do keyword research narrowed all the way down to the month and to the demographic area, the metropolitan area. So we can go out and tell how many people in Williamsburg and actually in certain zip codes search for Toyota Camry, or did they search for Toyota Camry SE, I think that's a model number on Camry, or red Toyota Camry in Williamsburg. So you need to go find out what those numbers are because those numbers, those terms are what you need to use in all your entities all over the internet. Sounds trivial. You guys maybe won't ever have to do that kind of thing, but you kind of need to understand when you start talking to SEO shops, SEO shops, search engine optimization people, we've all got the spam in our inbox. The guys from all over the world send us SEO spam all the time. There are a lot of those companies out there. So you need to know who's telling you the truth and who's not telling you the truth. Very first thing you do, if they tell you they'll get you on page one, just go ahead and delete that email and move on to the next guy. Because it's going to take a while. As you can tell from, from me talking about these processes, it's going to take a while to get you up in the search engines for any quality um, search engine terms to get qualified traffic into your web presence. Quality content, we talked about this. Um, let's, so let's talk about the long tail for a second. Um, again, this is something you probably won't ever have to do, but you need to understand this concept. Anybody know what long tail in search engine optimization? Good. Um, well, chime in. I'm going to start describing this. Go ahead. Um, well, you have uh, in your keyword research, you have um, the generic phrases, keyword phrases, and then you have very long tail phrases, which uh, make up a altogether the there will be only a very specific um, few people that will search a one long tail keyword phrase but they're more um, further along the conversion path than other generic phrases so you focus on providing on your content a lot of different long tail keyword phrases to capture that um, that audience that is going to more likely convert on your website versus someone who's searching for a generic phrase beautiful that's exactly right now let's give some examples here so that everybody totally understands this. When you go and search for something on the internet on Google or on Bing, sometimes you see if you search for a generic term, it gives you a million returns. You'll see the number up at the top or 20,000 returns. But when you start fighting to get your website up against all these other quality websites that are out there, you want to be as specific as you can and you want to trim down your competition as much as possible. So when somebody is on Google, and I'm going to move out of the way for 
in a second for the guys behind me, and somebody types Toyota into a search engine, there may be, a, I'm just gonna use round numbers here, there may, we may come back with 50,000 search results. And if your website is one of 50,000 search results, <laughs> odds are you're probably not gonna be at the top to begin with. Probably Toyota North America is gonna be up there and all of their web entities. Um, but you're gonna have a hard time getting up here. But if you trim down, if the person trims down their search for Toyota Camry, I have no idea why I'm using cars, but anyway, you may get 25,000 search results. So we're getting better, right? So if you're using Toyota, the term Toyota in your keyword all over your website, you're fighting against these 50,000 websites out here. But if you're using Toyota Camry on your website, this term, you're only fighting against 25,000 websites. If you're using Toyota Camry, we even throw red in there. Sorry, I'm writing fast. And then Williamsburg. And we use those search terms on our website. We may only be fighting against 5,000 websites. So there's our long tail. See how we're coming down right here? And eventually we get all the way out. Well, this is what our keyword research tools help us with. Our keyword research tools will help us find what these terms are right here that folks in a certain um, geographic area are actually searching for so that we can fight against 2,000 websites instead of against 50,000 or 100,000 websites. So that's long tail. That's one of the early things you wanna make sure that your SEO team or your marketing team that says they know anything about the internet or your agency that you're hiring to do, to help make you money on the internet, you wanna make sure they understand this concept. If they don't understand this concept, this is 101. This is SEO 101. If they don't understand this concept wholly, then again, you might wanna go talk to somebody else. Um, you don't wanna have to spend your time and waste your time explaining this to them. Go ahead. Oh, well, these are the terms you would use on your website. So key, when you finish keyword research, you probably have 200 terms that you'll wanna use all through your website. So you'll have, you use Toyota Camry Williamsburg and maybe the name of the dealership, you use Toyota Camry, red Toyota Camry, all over, in, anywhere on your website. You use blue, you use whatever those search terms are that come out at, in your report from your keyword research. Think about our company. Uh, well, I talked about our, our departments that we have in our company. You can imagine how many keywords we have that we want people to find us for. We want them to find us for inbound marketing, Hampton Roads. We want us to find inbound marketing, uh, Virginia, um, software engineers, um, and then uh, all the um, geographic areas. So we have a long list of search terms that we use throughout our website and throughout all the blog articles that we write. So you consistently use those same keywords yes. that kind of generate traffic? Absolutely. The more times you use it, the That's more right. popular on the sites. That's right, exactly. <clears throat> and going back to the uh, social bookmarking websites, when you enter your link to a blog article or to a website into a social bookmarking website, you also enter a title and you enter a description. In those, you also use your keyword search terms also. So that when Google's spidering dig, or they're spidering Facebook, which they don't do very often, or Twitter, which they do a little bit more often, they'll find those search terms and the link back to your website. So you wanna use that same list from your keyword research on your other links that are out there coming back to your website. Define Google Spider. Define Google Spider? Yeah, you use that term, I'm not sure. Spider is software. Um, it's software that, that any search engine has built, even the smaller ones like ask.com or Inktomi, they all have their own spiders. Um, there, it's software that goes out and finds a website, looks for a site map, a list of web pages on that website, and then it reads the content on those websites. And it reads the contents and, and smart phrases all through the website and brings it back and builds a dictionary of your website in their database. And that's what the Google, when you go to Google and you type a search term, it reads from all those dictionaries based on the weight that Google has given to your website or your web entity. Make sense? So you said using these keywords on the like on page on your co content, right? Yes. But what about the back background, like the meta tags? Because I have read somewhere that these days the meta tag of the keywords is not being used, and it's right. kind of 
tricky because people play around with that and just right. throw in a bunch of keywords there. Could you please talk about that? Yes, exactly. We're going to uh, talk about that some more in a few minutes, but I'll, I'll go ahead and hit it now. <clears throat> there were tons of ways, I'm going to say in the old days, but really just a couple years ago, that is the old days on the internet. Um, there were tons of ways to fake out Google and their spiders and Yahoo and Bing, all the big ones. Um, and one of the ways to do that is sometimes you go to a website and you don't see it too much anymore, but your website's right here and the scroll bar keeps going down. There's tons of white space down on the bottom of the web, on a web page. You'll see that a lot. Uh, what, what one of the tricks that webmasters used to do back in the day is if you had a white background on your website, they would put white text on that page and fill it up with all these keywords. So that when the spiders come through and they read your website, the spiders were not smart enough then, and they thought it was content for the website. People used to do that with meta, ta meta tags. Uh, meta tags are in the code behind the web page. You don't see them. The only meta tag that you see is the title tag at the very top of like Internet Explorer and Firefox. It tells you the title of the web page you're looking at. That's one of the meta tags, your title tag. And then there were keyword tags and there was a description tag. Those are the ones that, um, that he was referring to, and they're kind of going away. Um, descriptions are, are almost totally gone now. Keywords are still there, but they limit the number of keywords you can put in there. They only read like the first 20 or the first 25 now. So it doesn't really do any good. And they're on the way out too. Um, now the, all the spiders, search engine spiders, are smart enough to just read the content in, the web, in your website, in your web page. So it makes their dictionaries a little smarter a little more relevant for the searchers that use Google and Yahoo and Bing. Um, so again, you guys won't have to worry about that very much, but you will need to understand what meta tags are. Meta tags are the code, are, are tags in the head tag um, on the code behind the website. Um, and you're absolutely right, they're on the way out because of the smarter technology. Any other questions here? Um, do you Search engine optimization companies, software companies, are they actually, they have software that does a better job than that, or are they just, are they just using analytics and then sort of making the proper decisions? Okay, um, there's tons of ways to go with that. Um, we, we do that also, it's part of our package, we do SEO, um, and we do analytics for our clients, of course, as part of the marketing package. Um, Google Analytics is a quality tool. We have to understand it's a free tool. Sometimes it goes offline. Sometimes it doesn't track all the numbers. There's not a whole lot you can say because it's still a free tool. Businesses can't even buy into a paid version of it. Um, I'm saying sometimes it's offline. Once or twice a month, it might go offline. The reports that it gives, um, and really any analytical program, the reports that it gives are quality. There's not that many of them. You can customize them some to a certain extent. And, but you can get what you need as long as it's part of your package. You can't just use any um, analytics tool. Web Trends is probably the biggest on the internet right now. It's very expensive. A lot of larger companies use it. Um, you ha with Web Trends, you have to control the server, um, the actual machine that the websites are running on. It reads uh, log files off of the, the server machine. It's much more accurate, um, and you can customize reports for clients and, and that kind of thing. But what we found out is that analytics tools website and blog analytics tools should just be a piece of your analytics process. It shouldn't be the only thing you do. If you're not wrapping your, your web entity analytics in with your conversion rates, we talked about conversion rates a little while ago, marketing conversion rates and sales conversion rates. If you're not wrapping them all up into one report to present to your client or to your boss or, or your folks are presenting to you, then you're getting cheated. Um, because it's great to know how many hits you get on your website. We all like feeding our ego. Um, it's great to know who's linking to us from um, their website and that kind of thing. But if we don't know um, if those links coming in from those other websites are actually leading to sales, which is what we really care about, um, then, okay, so what? You're getting 10,000 hits from Facebook every month. Yeah, so. Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. Uh, and you get a lot of smaller companies, true SEO companies, that just totally rely on that. And whatever, I mean, they make a living. There are smaller companies out there that do it. And some small, small businesses can't afford the big packages we're talking about, too. So it's better to have that than nothing by far. Um, but if you're talking, 
running million dollar marketing budgets, um, then you're going to need much more information than that to make quality decisions, especially ROI decisions. I mean, they may have never have come, not everybody comes to your website. Correct. So how, how do you get that data? Yeah, that data is what you, you tap into Google and you tap into Microsoft and you tap into Yahoo and get that information from there. You buy in. No, you buy into that. You have to be a business partner with those companies to do that. It is very expensive. Um, but, you know, if you're in the business, if you're in the business of making money, it's an investment that you need to have. Which, again, is why a lot of companies, even um, bigger than small business, it, well, the, the top end SMBs in the world is a lot of the reason why a lot of them pull agencies in to do that kind of thing because of those kinds of tools. Um, there's expertise that you need to run those kind of tools and use them efficiently. Um, but yeah, you have to be trained, you have to be certified, and then you get those kind of tools and that kind of access to that kind of information. It's a good question. Okay, anything else? All right, one more on the slide. Strategic landing pages. We're gonna talk about landing pages in a second and why you should even have that. Does anybody know what we're talking about when we're talking about landing pages on a website? Well, I'm going to show you a slide of a landing page in a few minutes, but essentially it's a page on your website that's hidden. You can't get to it through the navigation, like your navigation links, your home, about, blah, blah, blah. You can't get to it on your website. It looks like part of your website. The navigation is usually gone off of it, and it's a link from another website to something you're selling or gathering or giving away on your website, but it addresses the audience of where they came from. Um, a great example, um, our company's Facebook business page. Um, in your Facebook business page, and your, you have your information and your phone number and web address and all that cool stuff. The web address that we use on our Facebook page does not go to jacegroup.com. It doesn't go to the home page. That web address goes to jacegroup.com slash Facebook. And it's a page, a landing page on our website that you can't get to if you're just on our website that says... Hello, Facebook user, thank you for coming over. It actually addresses the audience of where the traffic came from, and it talks to them, and it, it's giving them you know, some giveaway or providing them a free download of a webinar or something that they're looking for. It's a way to attract and generate leads. Landing pages are great because you have an attentive audience. They're there by choice. They're not just there surfing around the internet and found you on Google somewhere and came to that page. They're actually coming there for a particular purpose. And they came to the first page first. Yeah, somewhere else. Course, right. That, I follow right. That. So you know it's quality when it comes to Exactly. Quality. Exactly. We're going to get to it in a second, but um, our direct mail marketing, we, we're going to talk, and I'm going to show you an example of a direct mailer um, that we do for one of our clients. And we put landing page URLs on our direct mailers that go out and their landing page URLs. They talk to that ad campaign that's on that direct mail, that direct mailer that got mailed out to them. Um, so um, strategic landing page. Or changing the word of the manager, change the landing page so that you can. Right, okay. right, exactly. Um, and landing pages give you a way to track the successes of ad, ad campaigns too, because you can't get to that page unless you actually got it off of the medium um, that we used in the ad campaign. Does that make sense? That's an important point. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Um, right. Right. And I'll give you I'll give you a number. Um, uh, our website we probably have uh, I don't know maybe maybe fourteen thousand pages to our website. Um, in the navigation part of our website is probably is probably only twenty or so that you can actually get to. If you go to jsgroup.com and you start clicking around and get to all these pages, it's probably only 20. On our blog, because we blog a lot, almost daily, from all the departments in our company, um, we probably have, uh, I don't know, maybe 10, 11,000 pages on our blog. From cause We've been blogging since, I don't know, 2001, I think, almost 10 years now. Um, but then we have all these landing pages from advertising campaigns, from all these social communities, from anything that we do special. I didn't do it for this class, but when I go and speak around the country and I speak to an organization or I speak to a marketing group, um, I will always have a landing page at the bottom of my slides that they can get to. Um, and it's part of the takeaway on the handouts that these guys um, take away and go and look at next week when they get back to the office. And it's a landing page that addresses this audience that I'm talking to that day, 
gives them the handouts, gives them the videotape that they can download. So what does that do for me? It took us all of probably, um, took my guys probably two hours to set up the landing page from beginning to end. And we get so much branding and exposure out of that because it gives folks a way to share the PowerPoint presentation, to share the webinar and that kind of thing. So it's almost no effort to have your team, your guys working for you or your agency that's working for you to set up landing pages on your website. And over time, those pages just start building up. And again, you're tracking successes on those landing pages. It's not just surf through traffic. So for instance, I mean, are there certain kinds of groups or are there certain kind of activities where you're like, I'm gonna take that engagement because I know right. that's gonna pay, right. right? And I'm wondering how, have you, I'm sure you've worked this out, but can you give us some insight on how you maybe fine tune your well, see, he accepted this this, this gig here because he knows these are all going to go out and be multi-millionaires <laughs> and have these serves. Sorry, Barbara and Tyler here. Okay, clarify your question one more time. So, in the in the millions of different presentations you mm -hmm. could possibly do to various <coughs> groups, or right. companies, or right. whatever, right. right? You would really like to spend your time on the ones that are really going to hit you really well yes. with great leads, right? Yes. Has you that has the landing page? experiment change the way or who you've actually spoken to? Like absolutely. How does it change that? Yes, absolutely. You can tell the success is there. Um, this is very unique um, in that this class doesn't fit into that because, you know, this is an educational facility and, you know, you, you guys are not my potential clients and that kind of thing. Um, but when I go and speak to marketing associations, um, I just spoke to uh, uh, God, I'm going to mess up this name, um, Sales and Marketing Professional Services Association in Richmond just a couple weeks ago. Um, I know that those folks are potentially down the road going to be my true clients. They're definitely prospects for us right now. Um, I think that's the case. I think it's probably the case. When I got invited to go there, I thought it was then. It has proven now over the past few weeks since they're coming back and all of those folks are coming and hitting that landing page and I can see how many downloads. We've had several hundred downloads of the PowerPoint presentation since I left Richmond just two, two weeks ago, Randy, three weeks ago maybe. Um, and God knows how many webinars have been downloaded off of it. So to me, that's success. Um, there's, we talked about shotgun advertising a few months ago. Um, there's, there's shotgun techniques in that it, um, you kind of create, create some, you kind of treat some um, seminars as brand awareness type seminars instead of true lead, lead generation seminars, which is kind of the way we have to treat those. So I count just leads and not always quality leads coming in off of those because in that case, quantity to us is more important to, than quality. Because if I can get quantity and they share all the information, share the PowerPoint presentation, and share the webinar to all of their communities, that's more important to me because I'll get more quality leads off of that process. So tracking the numbers on those landing pages off of those speaking engagements is very important because it either validates or it shoots down my theories that I think it might be important and worth my company spending the money to me to go to Richmond for the day and not be back in the office working. So landing pages is the perfect way to do that. Landing pages is, is the success story from inbound marketing, period. It is the way to measure successes through inbound marketing. It's the jumping off point um, for, all, for your marketing conversion rates and your sales conversion rates. And I'm sure it tells you enough to, that there's certain groups that maybe you ought to go on and go somewhere else. Yes, yes, absolutely <laughs> sure does. It absolutely sure does. And it, many times um, we thought things were going to work out and landing pages proved us wrong. So we don't do that kind of thing anymore. We talked about Facebook. Landing pages have hel has helped us with Facebook. We'll get to that in a few minutes. We'll talk about that soon. Uh, that was my question, actually. Uh, I'm on that Facebook page right now. Can you explain to me the strategy? Um, it says I get a free social media t-shirt. Right. So people really like social media t-shirts. <laughs> and like they come in and they're really incentivized to put their information in and get that. Dude, you have no idea. Yeah. Um, that, that has been on that landing page now for um, 
about a year and a half. And I bet we've ordered five, 600 shirts. Um, so again, treating it as a brand awareness campaign, that means our shirts are out there in all those locations. Um, people we never would have met before, just Facebook friends, but what are Facebook friends, really? But now we're interacting with them. Now they're in our database. Now they're in our email list. They're opting into our email list. They get all of our newsletters. They forward out our newsletters. So now our database for our email campaigns is growing and growing and growing. Just off of those silly t-shirts. Yeah. So again, it's back to... <laughs> then we're back to, you know... Right. Right. If it didn't work, we wouldn't be doing it. We wouldn't do it. So, yeah, it works. There's some weird things out there that worked, <laughs> for sure. Sure. Okay. We good? Yes. Do you, uh, is there, is it a strategy of yours to, my, one thing I've always wondered is with these terms and the spiders and the rules that you have to follow for search engine optimization, you know, general copy for the, your homepage and different parts of your website, mm -hmm. but then bloggers. So the reason blogs are interesting and the people that the reasons people want to read them is because you know they're not that dry you know right. corporate copy. Right. Right. So how do you manage your humans that write this and yes. say we want people to read your blog because you're interesting and you write creatively right. and you're different, right. but at the same time you have to follow these rules. Yes. So that seems like a catch twenty two and a contradiction. So how do you do you teach that? Is that a skill to still be able to? write uniquely and awesomely, yes. but still get your words in there? It is, but I would also lean toward with the right people and the right personalities, it can be a learned trait also. Um, you have to be careful. You have to lay down guidelines. You know, we, we, we've all read social media guidelines are very, very important, especially for lar larger companies where the owner of the company can't control the marketing associate that just got hired three weeks ago. So there has to be social media and social community guidelines out there that they can follow. What can they say? What can they not say? What can they link to? What they can not And even with a company to. our size, we have to have those guidelines. We have to put those out because I can't go behind everybody and check and see what they're putting out representing our company on the Internet. So one of the very first things, if you ever get in there or when you guys get in there, you start taking over, either you or have your marketing director create that policy. You've got to make sure and control. Now, you want to give freedom. You want, you want your people to express their personalities out in social media. Otherwise, it's dud and dead and nobody will read it. It's like what you mentioned. It has to have personality. And it's even better if multiple folks are putting that content out and it's multiple personalities out there um, on your Facebook page and on your blog and on Twitter and that kind of thing. So uh, um, a lot of it is trial and error. Over the past three or four years, a lot of the social media tactics have been trial and error. See what works, see what doesn't work. Again, it depends on the vertical your company's in. Um, there are some verticals where you need to be more strict. Um, I subscribe to um, Harvard Business Review. I subscribe to their blog and read it in my Google Reader every day as part of my blog reads. Um, it's a totally different personality um, than reading, you know, some another advertising agency's blog that I also do read. So, so. Can you give us an example of like what you're talking about as far as rules and regulations can go? Or um, what topics you can talk about, what topics you can't talk about, what clients you can mention, what clients you cannot mention, how much of your client business you can mention. Think of me today, I'm talking today. Um, when we, even when we talked at lunch, I gave some numbers of some clients. I didn't tell you who the clients were. I'm not going to ever tell anybody a client information. There's some critical information that doesn't need to get out to the public. Um, so for several reasons, to protect the client and to protect us also. You know, to, the worst thing an agency could ever do is go blab, blabbing about a client out and it gets on the internet and then your next monthly meeting with them, they're like, what the hell? What are you doing? Last year um, in, the, in the camp, uh, we had a presenter who actually hired a few, two or three of our students to actually be a role like he's suggesting, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the first thing that they did was they went through sort of this little training program of what you can say, what you can't right. say, what's the appropriate behavior. Right. Because technically they represented this company and so, you know, it, it damages brands if you behave poorly, right? right? So, so that's kind of what 
what he's talking about. This, this was the first, right. this is what you can do, this is what we don't want you to do. And, right. Uh, so. right. We actually, our company is a little different because we are so much smaller. Um, we actually publish internally in our team ahead of time the topics that folks are going to write about. We have each of our team members submit topics they want to write about. Some get rejected, some don't. Um, there's not very often do I, but every once in a while I'll jump in, especially with our tech guys that want to talk about stuff that I'm not sure that's the audience we want to attract. <laughs> you know, I, they, sometimes tech guys get wrapped in their own little world and um, they might like something or like a topic um, and, and I guess this could fall for your marketing team also. They might like a certain topic and want to talk about it, but um, it do, it, your bean counters in the back room are going to tell you, we don't need to be talking about that because we don't need to attract that audience because that audience is not going to make money for us. So there's some no-nos that the team has to be told about also. Okay. Um, you mentioned that some advances in social media have been a result of trial and error. Yes. What do you think the cycle is? Do you know that if there's been a mistake, and would you classify those as um, kind of low-cost risks? Um, yes, I would classify them as low-cost risks. Um, in our case, we know every month, which is very odd. We just saw numbers from 2010, and very, very true. Those should be as as accurate as you would like for them to be. 2010, that was only a year ago. It wasn't that long ago. But those numbers are not accurate in the real world. We know because of some of the things we're talking about so far, our tests that we do through Facebook and through Twitter and our landing pages, we know they don't work. We know they don't work in some verticals and they do work in other verticals. Maybe those numbers are true in the automotive industry or on Coca-Cola's Facebook page. Um, maybe they're accurate. over time, um, and it's so hard because social media changes so much and so fast, hopefully over time we can even get um, quarterly rollover numbers year over year. Hopefully, you hope, but the social media landscape changes so fast, it's hard sometimes. So we try to rely back when we have our monthly meetings with all of our clients, which we do meet at least monthly, um, we pull up numbers, real world, no, real world numbers from both, both our test beds and from their actual website that we're working on, or their web entities that we're working all on. All right, one more. On down to the bottom. Um, how do we figure out what works and how do we figure out what doesn't work? We talked about this a little bit with our analytics. Brand monitoring, there's tools out there we can use on the internet, brand mon monitoring. Google Alerts is a great one. I don't know what Google Alerts are. Okay, you can sign up for Google Alerts, you put your email address in there, and you put a term in. Toyota, red Toyota Camry in Williamsburg. You put that term in there and it emails you every time that search term shows up on the internet. Anywhere. Anywhere that Google spiders. So as an example, in our company's Google Alerts account, we have our company name. So we know every time our company name shows up on the internet anywhere in real time. So because we have folks that work social media actively, which some of your marketing departments will, um, or your ad departments will, you'll have folks working social media. Google Alerts is a great tool. So there's several of those brand monitoring tools out there that will let you know in real time who's talking about you and what they're saying about you. So you can get out there and jump in those conversations. Maybe they need information, so you shoot them back to a link, a landing page, or a blog article, um, some web, web page that you guys have created. Analytics research, we talked about Google Analytics. Web Trends is, an, is, it, web trends is on top of the world. It's the best analytics program out there in expensive. the world today. It's very good, it's very solid. It's a great product, um, but if, if you're running uh, web entities that are getting you know, 20, 30,000 hits a day, you're going to need a product like that. Google Analytics is not going to be able to handle that. <clears throat> ROI calculations, um, we always um, tackle this piece in our monthly meetings, in our monthly prep meetings before we go and talk to our clients. And ROI calculations is where we get our accounting team, in our case, our client's accounting team involved and figure out how much it costs per lead to generate that lead and then how much return we get, the company gets, our clients get off of that lead that comes back in. So we need our accounting team involved in that or their accounting team involved in that and especially the sales team so we can 
at those conversion, sales conversion rates in there. You guys know what I'm talking about when I say sales conversion rates? Everybody good with that? Closed sales. Number of prospects, leads that come through, and the ratio of closed sales versus those. As opposed to a marketing conversion rate is the number of people that hit a landing page versus the number of people that fill out the form. That's a marketing conversion rate in inbound marketing. Make sense? Okay, so you have... <clears throat> So you have your ad campaign going on out here. And it points back to a landing page. And 500 people hit it. And on that landing page is a web form they fill out. There may be 50 of them. So what, 10%? So you got a 10, is that right? Yep. Somebody help me. 10% marketing conversion rate. I converted 10 of those, or 10% of those. All right, so 50 leads go off to my sales team, go off to this guy. He got 50 leads off of this ad campaign that got 500 in interested people, and maybe he closed five of them. So he's at 10% also. So that's your sales conversion rate. This is your marketing conversion rate. So you can see how much money we made off of these five deals right here versus how much money we spent to get these 500 people interested off of our ad campaign. Uh, so that's those ROI calculations. So you're, you're, your percentage is just based on leads for us. Yeah, bottom line. Yep. No, but I mean, it's off the 50, not the 500. You don't measure your effectiveness. You measure your effectiveness with the leads, not the effectiveness with the sales manager. No, we do both. We do both. Sales manager usually does this. Yeah, I said sales manager. Sales manager will do that. Your marketing director will do that. Gotcha. Or your VPs or whoever. Um, and, well, I was going to say your creative team, but your creative director really sometimes don't care if it's successful or not. He just cares if it's pretty. Usually there's a, there's a VP over this team, whether it's operations or whomever it might be. It might be a VP over advertising um, that cares about the dollars spent right here and the dollars made off of these five closes right here. And in our case, where we're an agency and we're presenting this in a monthly meeting to a client, we need to know this information <clears throat> right here. And what that dollar amount is, dollar spent here versus how much money we made right here, following down to re-engagement planning. That means on a monthly basis, we can readjust ad dollars every month. If pay-per-click's not working, we don't do pay-per-click the next month because it didn't work. Um, we don't have to wait six months to actually see that it's not working like we used to have to do with billboards. Direct mailers, even in our little, um, our little squares up here, our direct mailers are offline pieces because our direct mailers and even outdoor boards, billboards, because they have landing pages on them. And the success now off of our offline advertising gets wrapped into this, this dollar amount right here. We can go back and say we spent this much money on those outdoor boards or on printing on our direct mailers and and mail, and how much money did we actually make off of it? So it's no longer the creative director says, yeah, that was a successful ad campaign because his last quarterly monthly meeting he went to with all his creative director buddies, they all liked it. That's the way it worked back then. You're sharing a, a vodka martini with his buddy and, oh yeah, that was a cool ad, man, that was so cool. The Budweiser frogs, man, they were awesome. Well, how much money did they really make for the company? Bad example probably because that's a brand awareness campaign. But you see what I'm getting at? It's no longer in the creative team's pocket on whether an ad campaign was successful or not. It's actually, you can measure it in the bottom line. But I want that ratio down there to be kind of tough. Yeah, yes, you do. You do, and you think, it, you hope that it is because by the time these 50 leads get over here, they're qualified leads for the most part. Usually these leads, I can think of a couple of clients of ours their sales closing rates are not as high the first cycle of these folks coming through the routine because a lot of them are, yes, I'm interested, but I can't buy yet. Wait till next month or the next month or the next month. So they're delayed conversions coming back. So sometimes you see that kind of thing too. But if your marketing guy things. gets paid for having 500, right. I, I'd really rather him have 50 and pass me 50 and I close 50. 
That's right. So, yeah, but he's not going to get a good grade for 500. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, but see, that's where now your boss, not the marketing director, who back in the day could just say, oh, man, I passed off 50 uh, leads. Man, that's good enough. What would you do? Why didn't you close them? Well, now, now he, he can find out for sure what the problem is. Either there's a problem with sales, sales personnel, which is very easy to figure out because you talked about their process earlier, what the sales folks actually do for a living every day, and you control that process. If they're working that process properly, then this conversion, the sales conversion rate should be pretty high. So if the number that comes out of here, the dollar amounts that come out of here, is not as high as it should be, maybe the problem is right here, and you stomp your feet down in the marketing department again and see, guys, what's going on? Why are you not sending qualified leads down there? What is a good number of collateral? Depends on the vertical. It depends on the vertical. It depends on the service line. It depends on the product. Yeah, yeah. I would say the biggest, um, the biggest factor there is uh, um, cost of the product that's being sold. Um, think of Zappos. Everybody know what Zappos.com is? Sell shoes. They sell shoes online. I'm sure their conversion rate's pretty freaking high because they're selling $10 shoes and $100 shoes. There's a big range in there. But this Toyota dealership, their conversion rate's not that high. So it because it's a bigger dollar. Sure. Same with builders or real estate agents or that kind of thing. So you, you, it's different for each vertical and it's different in each market. You gotta remember that part too. Um, I just saw, I think it was a 60 minute piece that there's some town in North Dakota that's the booming town right now in the economy in uh, the United States. Uh, financial companies are moving up there. They're building homes. Um, you know, so if you're talking about a company, yeah, I know, very odd. That, that's what the story was. What the heck? What the heck's going on in North Dakota? But I don't know. There's industry all over the place there. Uh, it's the city with the lowest unemployment rate. Unemployment rate was like three-something percent, like nothing almost. Um, so that's going to skew these numbers if you try to, you know, just say, you know, what, what should the conversion rates be? So um, you don't know. a quick question maybe for the class to sort of take a step back from okay. what we have up here. I think this is a really great sort of way to look at what the process of leads and closes and all that kind of stuff. How does target, the target positioning and all that kind of stuff we talked about the first week sort of integrate into this? Like, where is its role? What What's sort of, basically the question is, why do we waste the first week if we could just kind of do this? What's the story? You need to know your audience. You need to right. know who you're targeting in order to be effective, and that can't happen unless you identify them. You don't know what to tell them on Facebook, or you don't know what to tell them on Twitter until you know who they are. All right, so it starts all the way up where the ads are, right, and kind of what they're thinking needs and all that and the communication. And when we talk about ad campaign, it could be lots of different vehicles we use to sort of communicate to that set, right? So just because, you know, it might be that billboards work. May be for a different target, other kinds of things work. There's lots of things that we could use to communicate with the appropriate target. All right? Um, what I was talking about last week was if we don't know that target, target step one, kind of funneling into that campaign, this whole process is kind of screwed up. All right? Um, and that's kind of why you know, we've often said this is sort of step one of the whole thing. All right? Yes. Absolutely. Good point. Good point. No, you know, you can't help but always thinking at the very beginning when you're even planning ad campaigns, when the, the order comes down from up top, and just, you know, hand off the job to the creative department, you know, is this, is this a lead generation campaign or is it a brand awareness campaign? So you've got to know that up front because there's different metrics to measure that kind of thing. Okay. Are we good on here? Especially this last point in here. That's a big selling point for inbound marketing because you're so nimble. You can change, you can move those ad budgets around quick. You don't have to let a billboard sit out there for six months like we used to back in the day, paying $8,000 a month you know, for a billboard and it sit there for six months and we don't even know if it worked or not. Here's a really quick question. So if you have a bill, you're doing a campaign for a company, it's a billboard, obviously people are gonna know what the product or the company, the company is. Sure. And then you say you there that, that there's also an opportunity of URL to go to a strategic landing page. Right. How can you, how, how can you mask the company and, and present a landing page like that on where you're not clicking through where that person is going to drive by 
and remember a, you know, a unique landing page versus right. sitting in their computer and Googling the company they sell on, sell on the board. Right. Um, it, that's a good point. And you have to be smart with your billboards when you start fitting billboards specifically into a lead generation ad campaign. Um, we are getting, I'll give you a real world example. We are getting ready to do um, a billboard in January. We have just kicked off the, the ad campaign, the creative part of the ad campaign. In January at the downtown tunnel in Portsmouth, leading into Norfolk. Um, the downtown tunnel in Portsmouth has traffic delays up to two hours every morning in rush hour and every afternoon in rush hour going the same direction. So those people, when I say traffic delays, the way it's kind of weird the way the geography is set up. Coming out of Portsmouth and into Norfolk on 264, on Interstate 264, you go down the tunnel, come up in Norfolk, and then there's the Berkeley Bridge, and the bridge is a drawbridge. So when you come up out of the tunnel on the interstate, that bridge is up almost every freaking morning in rush hour traffic. So when I say it's rush hour traffic and they're, they're backed up for two hours, they're sitting on that road for two hours. Perfect spot for billboards. So your landing page is sitting there. We put QR codes. Everybody know what QR codes are? We put QR codes even on the billboards because they're low mount billboards and we can get them up there big enough. So QR codes link to specific landing pages for the campaign just for this one QR code. So QR code, quick read code. It's like barcode. Um, you can read that that far? So yeah, if they're big enough, you can. Yeah, with your BlackBerry or iPhone. Randy, hold up my business card back there. Or somebody, look on the back of it. There's a QR code also on the back of my business card. If you snap that with your phone, it puts my contact in your phone automatically. So yeah. we also add them. Every one of our direct mailers that go out, we put QR codes in there. So yeah, if they're big enough, you can. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, these are low rise and they're right at the interstate, so you, you, they're successful. <laughs> Does anyone really use those QR codes? Like, do they, you know, use their phones and like go to that web page? Great question. Yes, we know that because of our landing pages. Yeah, yeah. Every now we didn't do it way back when, and I can't remember if the example I'm going to show you here is from back before we started doing it on, on all of our campaigns. Our direct mailers that we send out, we put QR codes. You guys know what direct mailers are? They're the half-size cards that go out in the mail, and you get them. Um, one of our clients is a builder, so we do once a month we do new direct mailers for them, um, and we put QR codes on them. And there's a landing page on the direct mailer. And the QR code that's also on there goes to a sister landing page. So it's two different ones. So we can tell the people under the same campaign that type in the URL versus the one that quick read and go to the landing page for the QR codes. Um, we actually started doing it um, <clears throat> late spring, late spring this year, testing them um, to see if they actually work, to do exactly what you're saying. As an agency, as a small agency, we started doing them free for our clients. Because we used all of our clients as test beds to see in what vertical they work and if certain parts of the country they're working. And they're working almost everywhere. Yeah, people are using them. It's kind of, I, when you were talking about testing, came, uh, I thought of this. But when you're uh, doing different campaigns, do you do uh, A-B testing or multivariate testing? And which ones have you found that are um, most helpful for for your company as well as for the companies that you work with? Um, their, um, yeah, um, the A-B testing that we do the most is off of our specific landing pages. Because as you can tell, we talk about them a lot. Landing pages are very important for many different reasons. It's the beginning of that sales process that starts up here with the marketing department. So the success of a landing page is also a variable in here. If we built a landing page in the web form where they fill out the little form, is down below the fold. It doesn't matter how pretty that landing page is, some people are just not going to scroll down and read it. So we do a lot of testing like that, like you're talking about, with varying styles and colors and sizes of the call to actions on landing pages to see what works and see what doesn't work. Yeah, there's, there's many different variations of A-B testing, but I, I think the one you're referring to is figuring out this versus that. What works here and what works there and what works for that audience and in the same controlled environment. 
Right. I should have asked you, was that the variation of A-B testing you're talking about? Okay, yeah, and, and again, the key to that is in the same controlled environment. So we, we work it, we'll do them sometimes in mid-month on a campaign, we'll switch a landing page, uh, you know, and change things around, move the web form from bottom right, still above the full, to top left, and see if we get more conversions, things like that, so. Um, you see that companies were like brilliant A-B. Yeah. yeah. That's what they would do with their yeah. direct mailers and, and this app. Yeah. So, right. Yes. So the landing pages, when it's a specific URL um, that takes you to the landing page, right. right? Do they always, do you always put a survey on there or a place for them to fill out? Or is it, are you using it solely as a metric? So, you know, it takes you there and then you X out of it and it goes into the page. Is that how it works? You're, you're saying... Do you always ask for information on it? I guess so, yes. Yeah, d for the mo no, I can't say always because there's some circumstances where it really doesn't matter. We're just testing hits on the page, see if we get traffic in there. But for the most part, um, it depends on the goal of the client or the goal of the campaign. If the goal of the campaign is to get, if it's for a nonprofit, it's, if it's to register new members or um, if it's, uh, you know, a real estate agent or a real estate company, a realtor that's trying to gather leads. So that's the great way to build that database and to, to get those leads into your database is through those web forms. And the more simple those web forms are, the better. Just get their name, their email address, and maybe their company, and that's it. You can get all the other information later. Because if it's a long form, you're going to drive people away and they're not going to fill it out. Is it always on uh, a landing page in a pop-up form, or is it a very no, distinct? Not ever is it in a pop-up form. Yeah, I was about pop to say. Pop-ups don't work on the internet anymore. People will go away from it. Yeah. Right, and you've got pop-up blockers everywhere now. In, in sure. Anywhere. So it's an actual tangible website yeah. that it goes straight to. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to show you a sample of a landing page here in a few minutes. Actually, you've probably already seen it over there on the one you pulled up. Yeah. Sure, sure. So you're reaching B2B businesses, and you create an incentive through whatever, you know, to go to your Facebook mm -hmm. page, to go subsequently to your landing, strategic landing page. Why wouldn't somebody just call? If they, why wouldn't they Some do? Who you, so what type of person goes through that flow and why, how do you translate like that type of behavior right. which is strange to not just like go to Google, which is what I would guess is most common, Mm -hmm. Figure out what are the businesses that provide this service. Start just either researching them on the internet, calling them. And then what's their incentive to take that next step and put their information? Well, let, let me... Great question, actually, because you're talking about the decision-making process. Right, right? So, that's right. Let me, back, let me back up to the beginning of your question first and maybe clarify the process that we use, and it may answer your question for you. We don't run ad campaigns not for any of our clients to send people to Facebook pages. We don't send them to Twitter pages. We don't send them to anywhere but their website and their blog. A Facebook fan page is controlled by Mark Zuckerberg. He changes that, that, the way that thing looks and the way it operates every other week, it seems like. So this website and blog, the entity on the internet that the company controls, they're in 100% control of how often it's up, how often it's online, how it works, how it functions, how it does whatever. So all of the ad campaigns that, that are run um, all point back to the website and blog. The traffic that comes from fa the Facebook page are folks that are already on Facebook. If it's by chance they hit our Facebook page and maybe they were a fan or our client's Facebook page. And then if they want more information, now that they're already on Facebook, they click there and they go off. So Facebook, Facebook as, a, um, as a generator of traffic, we don't ever see that as a competitor to Google. Hey, I, to Professor Hess, when I was more referring to just the decision-making process, and you know, from a human level, in this day and age, mm -hmm. looking at realistically how businesses go about seeking out vendors of your nature. Right. And I'm asking specifically in, in your situation, okay. your website, your infrastructure. Okay. Two things. How does that happen? Why would they be more inclined to haphazardly land on a Facebook page uh, that seems 
pretty consistent with the website, if not less robust, mm -hmm. then, uh, sorry, Mary Kate. And then uh, basically from that, how does that translate, like the efforts that you're doing, how does that translate to incremental? Because it seems like if you just stuck with what you had and focused on the Google, then they would get right to where they need to be in the way that they get there. That, well, maybe I didn't explain that. That is what we're actually doing. We don't put a lot of emphasis and a lot of time, even for our clients, into what goes on our Facebook page. Our Facebook page and our client's Facebook page, for the most part, is automated from the blog. When blog articles are written and new content's put on our website, it automatically gets to the Facebook page, which the Facebook audience reads. So there's almost no time investment at all on handling that Facebook page. Let's back up for a second and maybe just clarify your question. Yeah. Um, let's put it into an example. Let's just say um, we're interested in understanding this topic and you're an executive, right? And you know that you should be doing something here, but you don't know exactly what. Is that you know, the scenario we have? Yeah. Start. Yeah. So what do you do? Are you going to Google? Or what? what is that process before you actually choose the company and that sort of thing? So what do you guys, I'll just put it out there with you. How would this happen? By the way, I agree with you on that I was process. Doing right. some research recently, I mean, it's something, some studies say up to 75% of people look to their social networks before making any sort of purchase decision. So that's why I think, getting back to your fundamental question, why you want to be on Facebook, you may put out there, hey, does somebody know a company that does this? And somebody else says, oh, yeah, here's their Facebook page. And then you get shooted off into it. How does that social part then work here? in say B to B. I, I easily see it in B to C, if that's not a problem. But what what is that that we're doing? I think it lends personal reference. Okay. Like you know, you're making it's an automatic contact. It's almost as good if you can go and read about a company and understand it off of that almost a, more of a human aspect. It, it's that automatic reference-based selling and marketing that B2B requires. That word of mouth, right? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But why would you pick up the phone and call me? Yeah, yeah, just you call because about it's a hand in the butt. I don't, I don't want to talk to you, people, especially not at first. I want to establish a relationship with your friend. I'm, I'm, a I'm in a business just yeah, like you are. And just saying, hey, you know, who did you use? Why don't you just come on the phone and say, who did you use? Because it's so easy to click and read about it. And then once I kind of know the questions to ask, I call my buddy and say, well, how did they do this? How did they do that? But it's it's too easy to just click and go read about you like this and make that determination off of that, whether I want to waste that time. But would you use Facebook things. for that or the web? Facebook. Sorry? Would you use a Facebook for that or would you use his website for that? Or Google it? Either or. Okay. Whatever is readily available. Like, I think you're saying, Meredith, that if somebody, oh, here's the Facebook like page and it's got really great blog articles, I'll go there. If not, I'm going to go to the to the web page and figure it out from there. The, um, the landing pages that we consult on and the, one, the ones that we build, um, we remove the navigation from the landing pages, but you can click on the main logo and get to the home page. So we try to keep that, you gotta remember they're a targeted audience anyway. They wanted to be there, they wanted to get there. So we want to get them to fill out that web form or whatever the call to action is on that page. But we don't wanna do it so much that we piss them off. So there's still a link behind the logo usually that they can get to the home page and do more research, yeah. right? So you walk that fine line of not upsetting them. Just gonna say, uh, what, is there a risk at what point does having so much information out there with inbound marketing that you actually constrict your funnel so tight that it becomes counterproductive? I have not seen that happen um, what I've seen is the more information, the better. We just talked about the, the, the different behaviors of consumers and how they go out and search for information today, whether they want to pick up the phone first or whether they want to go and do research. For those that want to pick up the phone, there's phone numbers there to call and get all the information they want. But the more information we can have out on the Internet for both us and for our clients, we feel the better off. Um, to begin with, it throws out more tentacles all over the internet to catch traffic. Um, and the other, the other piece is um, it puts out 
um, very relevant data about all of our products and all of our service lines um, that could answer almost any question that a searching consumer could ask. See, that, that's, my, that, that's my fear is that I'm, how many times in business do you have a one-off sale? Someone comes to you looking for something because they think they have a specific need, but they don't really know, and then you sell them right. something else. Right. So if they go on there and they look for what they think they know and all the information's there, right. and they decide not to buy it, then you lose that opportunity there to, is. to help yes. them to find their need, yes. which is a big problem. Yeah. You have to figure that out, and that's going to be in your sales strategy. I mean, you're going to have to figure that out ahead of time. If you're in the type of business where that is the case, um, I could see real estate being that way. I mean, a, a family may be looking for one specific type of home, not even knowing what all the options are out there, whereas if they just picked up the phone and called an agent, an agent could show them all the options, you know, at, at their fingertips. Um, but that option is there, but there's also that whole set of consumers that you don't want to not give them that information if, if they actually want to go and look for it themselves. We'll do one more, and then we'll take a break. Okay. Follow up to Facebook. I know a lot of companies have policies against using Facebook on company time. Right. How does that fit into the approach? It's getting better. It's getting better. Um, the companies that we've run across, and we actually have a couple of clients that do not allow their employees to get on any of the social media websites um, during work hours. Um, a lot of times the education piece, you get in and you talk to the marketing director, you talk to the VP, um, and you give them a purpose for them, their employees to be able to get out there and interact. On Twitter is a great example. If you can talk to, you can talk strategy with a marketing director about um, and show him or her the value of the software engineer back in the corner being able to get out and tweet with his software buddies or with a, another um, software director out on the internet and they're indirectly representing their company, it's almost free advertising. So how do you deal with that? It's an education piece. We tread the fine line there also with we have to make sure that when we consult and try to talk a company into opening up those avenues, that we understand why they have it closed to begin with. One question about being a B2B focus that, that you have, mm -hmm. targeting B2B organizations through Facebook might seem counterintuitive if those organizations, big organizations, are not, uh, the people that make decisions are right. not allowed to be on Facebook. Gotcha. So how is that relevant? And because unless I'm wrong, that was my understanding that that's a, a trend because people abuse company time. Right. Right. I think we can probably rely on. Um, you're right. I didn't hear that the first time. Um, I think we can rely on our social graphic studies and our demographic studies to begin with, and uh, not so much demographic social graphic studies definitely to find out the trends of where our audience is hanging out on the internet. If they're hanging out on Google, that's where we need to to spend our dollars anyway. If they're hanging out on Facebook or they're not on Facebook, we're going to know that ahead of time. So we're not going to spend the dollars, the internal dollars anyway, to try to, to communicate with them on that, that medium. So I think that gets uncovered early before dollars actually get, to ex execution dollars get spent on those campaigns. So what are alternative ways to get a Facebook to um, Well, I, 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 don't, I don't think Facebook really comes into it. If, if Facebook is closed off, um, I've never seen where search engines are closed off. Um, because if a company, I had a great question um, at the last seminar that I went to, the sales and marketing organization. There was a lady there that was a marketing director for a builder that built elementary schools on, on the Eastern Seaboard. And her audience was or is um, the public school systems up and down the East Coast. Okay, so she's like, why now the class that she actually sat into wasn't specifically a B2B class, so she was like on the on the verge of the folks that I was talking to. And she's like, you know, she listened to most of it and she said, you know, I'm trying to get value out of this, but I'm not seeing it. Where are these folks gonna get my message? If I want to get out there and I want to talk, I want to get out and get it on my website, I want to get all the information out there, I want to blog, I want to you know, get out on Facebook, 
And she's like, I don't see it because my audience, public school system, is not going to be out there. And we sat there and we talked for a second, and I, and I told her, I'm like, all right, well, if the decision maker is um, – the superintendent of a public school system or his staff, his or her staff. Um, what they're gonna do is go back and do research on you as a builder and check on the old schools that you've built. And they're gonna go out on the internet and they're gonna search for every testimonial, every comment, every anything they can find out about the buildings that you built in the past. Are the teachers complaining? Are the parents complaining? Is there something wrong with the HVAC systems in that building? Is there something wrong with parking? Can buses not get in and out of those systems? Those are the kind of things that the consumers are going to be talking about, about your own product, even though you're in B2B, you still care what the consumers are saying about your product. So that information is going to get found on the Internet where the average user of those products are. Right, but that the specific sense? origins of this tech that you're referring to, that you presented, the strategic landing page, right. comes from either an ad campaign, right. so a banner, I'm assuming, the medium could be anything. It could be a pa pay-per-click ad. It could be a direct mailer. It could be a billboard. It could be um, it could be a banner ad. It could be a Facebook ad. It could be uh, there's yeah there's hundreds of ad mediums. It could, it could be a newspaper ad. It could be a radio spot. It could be a television commercial. We do those too, and we use landing pages successfully through those. Let me throw one quick thought in there. Landing page, jacegroup.com slash I love you. <laughs> Could be a Valentine ad, okay? That's a landing page sample. I love you.com, you can go purchase that for $11 from godaddy.com. I love you.com can also point to that ad. So when you're advertising your landing page URLs, they don't have to be 50 characters long. They can be I love you.com on your ad, and it points to your landing page back here. So there's little tips and tricks to get people mentally to be able to remember on billboards. We talked about billboards. Get people to remember URLs, catchy URLs. For one of our builders, I'll tell you a funny one that we did. One of our buildings, builders, we did um, builders like they build condo communities. Um, their, their target audience is young professionals coming out of college. So they're, uh, I think their demographic is 25 to 34. Um, and they're catching, they, they, we ran a spot for them in a newspaper catching folks that are coming out of apartments. And we targeted a, a geographic area in the neighborhood and ran that ad in there. And the URL to the landing page is uh, mylandlordiscrazy.com. <laughs> and that ad is probably the most successful one um, because of that crazy URL. People can remember it. They're like, oh, what the heck is this? So you can also throw you know, those little psychological fancy things in there. In there too. So landing pages don't have to be long and ugly. So let's take a break.